Professor of Migration Studies and Director of the Migration Policy Centre at the European University Institute. With a background in political science and public policy, Andrew's research interests include the politics of global migration, mobility and asylum, and in particular interstate cooperation and public attitudes to migration. And today he will be presenting on migration gov governance for, of, and against crisis. Um, so I'll hand over to Andrew now to get started. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep, we can hear you. Great. Uh, so very, many thanks for the invitation. And I was just finding out about the some of the re research initiatives you're involved with, which sounds really interesting. I, as, as Sarah said, I, I'm from the European University Institute in France. I direct something called the Migration Policy Centre. My background is political science and public policy. Uh, and so in this talk, what I'm interested in particular is issues around the kind of politics and governance of migration and ideas about crisis. And I'll touch upon uh, some important trends and also look at some of the uh, trends in attitudes to migration, particularly in the context of the uh, forthcoming European elections, which will uh, occur at the beginning of June this year. So the title is, I suppose, because it's making reference to the continual association of the word crisis with migration and migration governance. Uh, and so just as I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, we do have people who refer to migration governance being in crisis. Uh, governance, which is in a sense trying to manage crisis or of crisis. I think there are also political actors in Europe who in a sense are mobilising for crisis. And similarly, political actors are mobilising against crisis. So that's why I came up with this title of migration governance in, of, for and against crisis. So to give a sense of the argument I'm going to develop, what I'm particularly interested in is the way in which notions of crisis in, in, to be in European migration governance become very associated with pressing global challenges, global challenges that could lead or seem as potentially lead into the breakdown of natural and social systems. And the reference here is to a term which now is occurring quite frequently in global debates, the word polycrisis. And migration, or particularly forced migration, is often located in terms of this debate about a polycrisis, a number of intersecting crises of natural and social systems. Uh, and migration is often located in the context of debate about this, this kind of idea of a polycrisis. Uh, I think what's happened is that crisis thinking has become normalised in European migration governance and it's also now projected into neighbouring countries and regions. So if you look at recent developments in Europe, you see attempts to externalise migration controls to Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, or, or in the case of the Italian government with uh, Libya, sorry, Albania, and of course the UK government with uh, uh, Rwanda or attempts to externalise to Rwanda. Uh, what we've seen is that notions of polycrisis, but also associated ideas like permacrisis, metacrisis, or crisification, have become, in a sense, constitutive of European migration governance. The idea that migration is one crisis among other crises that threat has you know, threats to destabilise uh, the European political system. Uh, as I said at the start, I think there are political actors that are mobilising for crisis. And so I'm particularly thinking of the rise of radical right-wing anti-immigration political parties across Europe that, in a sense, mobilise around notions of crisis and have profited from uh, perceptions of a migration or refugee crisis. And I also think there's an intellectual agenda that supports the, the, the mutations of thinking around crisis that, in a sense, catastrophize migration represented in crisis terms, often speak in apocalyptic ways about the potential for large scale or mass migration. Uh, so the crisis debate, I think, has been particularly attached to this kind of catastrophization of migration, equating it to a uh, uh, some kind of disaster. Uh, what I'll do in particular, look at how migrant migration is linked to climate change are often uh, seen as emblematic of polycrisis or permacrisis. But I think that, as I'll show, I think there are significant conceptual flaws. 
And if we do think in these terms and, and link migration, climate change to notions of crisis, then actually I think it's more likely to amplify the systemic breakdowns against which these ideas ostensibly are warning. Uh, and so I, I argue that extracting migration from this crisis thinking can illustrate how migration has been, is and will continue to be part of a solution to the deep-seated problems in social and natural systems that various notions of crisis claim to address. So I'm arguing essentially that migration is a form of adaptation, has been and is likely to continue to be a way to address some of the problems that people will face in, in, the fa in, in light of significant challenges economically uh, and also environmentally, as well as other challenges that are currently evident. So that's breaking down the argument for you. Uh, in terms of structure, I'm going to just do five things. First, think a little bit about what crisis thinking entails. Then look at what I call normalised normalized crisis in EU migration governance, its projection. Then I'm going to uh, ask why this has happened, which I think is linked to the fear of large numbers. Issue salience, where we can look at some of the trends in attitudes to migration in Europe, and also selectivity in policy, by which I mean a particular focus on certain forms of migration viewed as particularly problematic and to be controlled or deterred, even though other forms of migration may be facilitated or encouraged. So selectivity in policy, I think, is a key trend. Uh, then I'll think about crisis in a sense as a mode of governance. And finally, this, what I refer to as the, the polycrisis trap. So first of all, per, uh, crisis thinking. Well, uh, I didn't know that there was uh, such a thing as word of the year, but for the Collins Dictionary, the word of the year in 2022 was permacrisis, uh, which I think is quite closely associated with the idea of polycrisis and the other things that I'm, the other variations I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so for the meaning of this, I think the, essentially what these kind of fo this focus on perma or polycrisis addresses is this coalescence of global systemic risks and then locating migration within them. So that would include climate heating, biodiversity, loss, pandemics, widening economic inequalities, financial system instability, ideological extremism, pernicious social impacts of digitalization, cyber attacks, mounting social and political unrest, then large scale forced migrations and escalating danger of nuclear war. These are all kind of being identified in uh, the literature about polycrisis as indicative of the, uh, as the bullet points say, the, uh, a series of crises which are increasing in severity, referred to as risk amplification, occurring at a faster rate, risk acceleration, and occurring simultaneously, risk synchronization. So amplification, acceleration, and synchronization of risk are seen as being emblematic of this idea of polycrisis. And located within this discussion of polycrisis is migration, although to be more specific, large-scale forced migration, which, as we know, is only a part of migration, but tends, I think, to catastrophize migration, to represent it, in a sense, as a disaster, and to put it alongside these clear and uh, prevalent systemic risks. So, so I'm certainly not arguing that these are not significant risks and challenges. Clearly they are. What I'm arguing is that uh, migration, understood as large scale forced migrations, uh, tends to then misrepresent migration uh, and to catastrophize it uh, and locate it as part of a debate which then, I think, it encourages approaches which seek to deter migra migration and to lead to high levels of investment in border controls and border security, which uh, could be argued are counterproductive. So just to give a sense of what I meant by looking at, you know, looking at entries to Europe, this is looking at number of first residence permits issued by reason across the European Union over the last, uh, well, between 2013 and 2022. And breaking down by the main reason for the issuance of those permits and what I can see the red line at the top is my uh, admission for employment purposes which remains a dominant motive for entry you see a significant dip at the time of the pandemic and then a recovery in 2021 and quite a high level in 2022 uh, you'll then see a blue line which is family migration which is often neglected but is a key form of migration to Europe family migration is and uh, will remain a key migration route to Europe you see the uh, other category that is primarily for protection purposes so people seeking some kind of protection status either as refugees or some other protection status 
Uh, you'll see that that had increased significantly after 2015 and also rose, well, if at the most recent date for 2023, there were 1 million asylum applicants made across, applications made across the European Union. And then at the bottom, you see the kind of gold line, which is admission for education purposes. But the point I would make here, of course, is that uh, admission for protection uh, tends to dominate a lot of the political debate uh, and contributes to the idea that migration may be a form of an act of desperation. But when we look at the first residence permits issued by the European Union over a 10 year period, we see that education, employment and family put together are the dominant reasons for entry to the European Union. And at least encourages to think about the way in which not only kind of desperation is a motive for migration, but also hope, ambition and aspiration are key migration motives informing family education employment routes. Of course, all these routes are themselves highly diverse. So the employment route would include shorter and longer term migration, would also include migration to lower and higher skilled employment. So these are very diverse categories. But I think it's important to contextualise the uh, protection route and locate it alongside other forms of migration to Europe. It can also be useful to contextualize this in relation to boat arrivals. So this data here is looking at boat arrivals via Mediterranean routes into Europe between 2015 and 2024 from UNHCR data. Uh, and so what we can see on the chart on the left is sea arrivals map, uh, charted by day. And you see the significant peaks around the time of large scale Syrian arrivals, 2016, 2017, diminishing significantly and then picking up again 2023 into 20, uh, and uh, the sort of strong increase in 2023. And you'll see the aggregate data by year uh, in the table on the left to 157,000 arrivals. And the figures in red are the, are the number of people reported dead or missing. So more than 24,000 people have been reported dead or missing since uh, 2015. So significant numbers of uh, dead or missing people also reported in the Mediterranean. But I think one of the things about this data is it represents, I suppose, a, a key and pressing issue. And policy attention has been very, very focused on boat arrivals. Uh, but at the same time, if you're looking at these boat arrivals in a context of wider admission to the European Union, you're probably talking about five or six percent of total arrivals in the European Union by these boat crossings. But if you ask people to uh, pick an image that to them emblemizes migration to Europe, it's often of small boats with young men, typically from African countries, trying to uh, move to the European Union. So, of course, it is an important issue, but it has attracted significant levels of attention. And I think pay, it plays into the kind of crisis framing of migration. Uh, but as we can see, numbers have picked up in 2023 uh, and we'll have to see what happens in 2024. Uh, but I think the point I would make here is that the you know, it's important to think to contextualise reasons for entry to the European Union and, and to understand the directions in which political attention is, is focused. Uh, oh, sorry, something's gone wrong with that slide. Uh, so sorry about that. I'm not quite sure what went on there. But anyway, uh, I'll try and explain what it says. So what I, what I would argue is that crisis, in a sense, has become a, almost like a normalised mode of migration governance in the EU. And, and we can see this since the century, since the end of the Cold War in 1989. A normalised crisis, I think, means concern about the potential for large scale and potentially uncontrollable migration. Uh, and before the second bullet point goes haywire, uh, the, the the text there says whether accurate or not, these kind of perceptions matter and they have real effects. So between 2014 and 2019, I had a grant from the European Research Council for a five-year project was looking at the drives of migration governance. What I was particularly focused on was how actors in within migration governance systems understand the challenges that they face. Uh, and one of the key things that came out talking to hundreds of people at relatively senior levels across the European Union was concern about the potential for large scale and uncontrollable migration, whether real or whether accurate or not. These kind of perceptions I think have had very real and powerful effects and contribute to this kind of normalization of crisis. Uh, and so at the end of the Cold War, there was concern about large scale migration from former Soviet bloc countries. 
and now we see concern about large scale migration from African countries. Uh, and uh, I suppose we, if you we, we could talk about migration in from uh, uh, so sort of, well, within Africa and out of African countries. Uh, but there are significant reasons to doubt some of the uh, projections of migration from Africa that have occurred. And also uh, note that at the same time, they do tend to feed into perceptions of what has been called a myth of invasion. Uh, so I think crisis has become normalised. Uh, I think what we've also seen is an increased level of political attention to migration. And what I would emphasise here is that research in political science, which points to migration forming part of a important new political dividing line in Europe, a new kind of cleavage or dividing line in European politics, which has been broadly characterised as being between the winners and losers of globalisation. Uh, and my issues like migration and European integration, European and Euroscepticism are seen as constitutive of a new dividing line in European politics. And broadly speaking, that's been uh, characterised as dividing those who perceive themselves as the winners or the, being the losers uh, of globalisation. Uh, what we know is that attitudes to immigration are relatively stable. So if we look at oh, long term uh, over the last 25 years, we can see that attitudes to, to immigration are relatively stable. And we can also see that over time there are trends towards greater favourability. So you know, while not arguing that Europeans are in favour of migration, attitudes are relatively stable. And if anything, there's trends towards greater favourability. But what I would emphasize, and what I'll just show some data on in a few moments, is this question of issue salience. Issue salience is a level of public attention to the migration issue. Uh, and I've looked at this in previous research with colleagues here at the Migration Policy Center. We've looked in at look, is how issue salience has been the key driver of the rise of radical right wing anti immigration political parties across Europe. So it's not gen level, it's not attitudinal change in general terms, it's specific levels of issue salience, which has been a key driver of political change in Europe. Uh, what this has meant is that radical right anti-immigration political parties have moved to the mainstream. So the country that I, I live in, Italy, uh, we have a party which is now the leading party in government called Brothers of Italy. Uh, um, uh, just uh, two or three years ago, they were a fringe party with a very small percentage of the vote calling for a naval blockade. Now that party is the dominant party in Italian politics and Italy has become the key member state within the European Union on migration, which I think shows how what were fringe radical right anti-immigration parties have moved to the mainstream. And I would also argue that those political parties have had to confront actually the dilemmas of governing. And I'll show what that means in the Italian context a little bit later. But the point I wanted to emphasise in particular is a role played by issue salience so what I've got here, and it might be a little difficult to, to read, uh, is uh, charts showing the uh, perceived importance of, uh, of immigration to your country, the EU, and yourself between 25 and 2023, organised by EU member state and also included in the UK, uh, which has now been included again in Eurobarometer data. So this is taken from Eurobarometer. And what it's doing is mapping issues, saying is people are asked to identify the, uh, the most important political issues they see as facing their country, themselves, and the European Union. What is What you can see is a fairly steep spike across Europe in around 2015, diminishing after 2015, but also begin, you see an uptick in some key EU member states after uh, well, really after, after the end of the pandemic. So the European Union as a whole is on the second row and second from the right. And you can see there the kind of peak in 2015 and the uptick that is occurring uh, you know, over the last couple of years. And I think this is quite significant in the light of European elections where there is there have been forecasts of a significantly stronger performance by or strong performance by radical right anti-immigration political parties who may be could be much more pivotal within the European political system within the European Parliament and then have influence on the European Commission that will be appointed after the June 2024 European Parliament elections. Just to extend this analysis a little bit, uh, 
this step, this chart is looking at uh, the percentage le listing each issue, each of those issues you can see in this chart are the one of the most important effect in the EU. This is looking between over the, the six month, the, the period between May, June 2023 and October, November 2023. It's pan EU data taken from Eurobarometer. And what you can see here is that immigration has now become a key concern across the European Union uh, on, a, on, a level, on a par with the war in Ukraine. Uh, and overtaking issues such as inflation, uh, which previously level with the environment, but is now at levels of concern about immigration exceeding uh, le the levels of concern about environmental issues. So immigration has become a key issue in uh, European politics, a, ma a matter of significant public concern. Uh, and this is the, the number of people seeing uh, listing each issue as the one, one of the most important effect in one's own country. Uh, you can see the dominance of inflation, but you can also see that between May, June 2023 and October, November 20, 2023, there was an uptick, uptick in con levels of concern about immigration. Uh, so I think that you know, there is research evidence that shows that higher levels of issue salience have played an important part in driving support for radical right anti-immigration political parties. We saw it after 2015, and we can see again now an increase increases in issue salience, levels of public attention to to migration. What we also see, and I think this is a uh, link to the debate about salience, is is the kind of policy selectivity. Because I think the debate about migration policy isn't a debate about openness versus closure. But it's it's a, a debate about how you manage the relationship between openness and closure, uh, and what we were, what I'd ad identify and think the significant research evidence which would show that the key trend in European migration policies over the last thirty or forty years is selectivity, which is I think emblematic of this this, this balance between openness and closure, where some routes of migration remain relatively open, but there is an increased focus on deterring or preventing forms of migration which are seen by states and their policies as unwanted. And that has been led to particular focus on asylum seeking and also on what you could call the irregularization of migration, which is in a sense forcing migrants into irregular routes. So people who might previously have been able to access regular pathways to seek protection or seek employment are irregularized. And of course, we can also see that is particularly focused on people moving from countries in Africa and the Middle East. So clearly it's an also a kind of racialized selectivity as well. Uh, but I think it is in this uh, relationship between openness and closure is re really important. And just to provide an example of that uh, is a situation in Italy, which I think could be referred to as organized hypocrisy, but in, in a sense is the dilemma that all governments face. All governments will uh, have to deal with competing interests and pressures and at times interests and pressures may be contradictory so governments in a sense will often may find themselves doing hypocritical things saying one thing doing another uh, or trying to appease competing and contradictory interests so in Italy at the moment the public debate is very focused on controls the government here is very focused on controls and border security uh, and so and that has involved deals with Tunisia, Egypt, cooperation with the authorities in Libya and now trying to offshore asylum to Albania. But at the same time, and with less attention, the Italian government has announced plans to recruit 452,000 new migrant workers between 2023 and 2025. So a large expansion of pathways for regular migrant workers to enter Italy because there are acute labour market shortages in some economic sectors and a high reliance on migrant labour in important economic activities and also in areas such as social care because here in Italy uh, care for instance for elderly relatives is often taken on by families who use migrants to support family provision. So what, you, what I think is happening in Italy is this uh, is a is a kind of representation of the tensions that arise because of the as a consequence of selectivity and also the kind of strong focus in European policies on border security and border control, leading to a government which is very keen to signal its determination to defend the Italian border, while at the same time 
creating pathways for large-scale regular migration into the Italian labour market. Uh, I think that perhaps is inter an interesting reflection on how what was uh, and, and still is in its roots a far-right political party, Brothers of Italy, the, government, the largest political party in Italy, whose origins were in fascism, the, the, the post-fascist party, is now in government in a position where it is trying to mediate relations between member states at the EU level and also appease powerful interests in Italian in, in Italian society, particularly business interests, who are strongly organising for more open recruitment policies for migrant workers because of the labour market shortages that there are in, in this country. I think you, you could extend that debate because it would be a, you know, obviously what you have in the European Union and in the UK are 28 debates about migration. But I think Italy has become a really significant country because of its geographical position, the issues that it faces, the, the kind of government that's taken power in Italy and also then what you see in terms of the uh, this kind of organised hypocrisy trying to uh, appease uh, competing and at times contradictory interests around migration issues. So I think that what you end up with is that crisis in a way becomes a mode of governance. Uh, and what I mean by that is that governance itself, you know, any, any governing organisation has got to have some understanding of... Uh, the environment in which it operates. And I would refer to that here as the conceptual representation of change underlying the social natural systems. Governing organizations have to have some understanding of what's going on. Uh, so, the, the, so this conceptual representation could be expressed more intuitively as some understanding of what's going on out there. And I think in, th in those terms, words such as crisis, polycrisis and permacrisis have become important components of the underlying conceptualization of the changes that could be driving migration or large-scale migration uh, and based on these kind of conceptualization then then you see efforts to steer or manage these changes understood you know addressing basically this question of, well if we have some understanding of what's going on out there then what should we do next and I think that then leads to crisis driven responses crisis management or efforts to in relation to migration which focus on border security and on deterrence efforts to seek to deter migrants uh, so this that then I think leads to what I would refer to as a polycrisis trap so going back to the definition of polycrisis I mentioned earlier within this definition the the migration referent is large-scale forced migration so not to migration but to large-scale forced migration which is seen is kind of represented as the migration challenge uh, and I think migration and climate change have become uh quite powerfully linked, in particular around apocalyptic projections of huge and large scale movement, which if it did occur in anything like the scale it has been predicted will be deeply disruptive and be a significant security threat. And so we can see work dating back into the 1980s through the 1990s where large scale uh, displacement was projected as a consequence of climate change. Uh, but I would argue that this is not necessarily grounded in any recognisable realistic understanding of migration. You know, the kind of relatively simplistic idea of climate is a trigger for mass migration. What we do know from the research on the relationship between uh, migration and climate change is that the climate signal will be a signal alongside other economic, political, social and demographic signals. So that we, we, it may be difficult to detect the climate signal, particularly in the context of slow onset change. Uh, uh, and, and the climate signal will, will obviously affect and at the same time be affected by economic and political change, as well as by demographic and social change. We also know that in the context of climate change or in the context of, of economic and political change more generally, most migration will be internal to states. We also know that most international migration displacement is likely to be the next safe place. What we might also see is people actually moving away from one kind of risk uh, associated with climate change, but moving towards other forms of risk. If, for instance, they move to informal settlements in rapidly growing urban areas in coastal cities in parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. So movement towards risk. And we also know that uh, the climate crisis can 
uh, erode the resources that people need in order to migrate. Migration requires resources. If people are becoming poor, essentially, as a consequence of climate change, then they may find themselves tra essentially trapped. And particularly those groups who are more vulnerable may find themselves trapped. So I think that the kind of the apocalyptic, project, apocalyptic projections of numbers that can lead to a misrepresent or catastrophize migration, but also lead to a misrepresentation of the challenges and also mean that it's much more difficult to then discuss the ways in which migration has been in the past, is currently and will necessarily be part of a solution, a form of adaptation uh, to the effects of climate and environmental change because facilitated movement can offset risks of forced displacement. Thinking about mobility schemes which can facilitate movement now perhaps on a seasonal basis to allow people to sustain their livelihoods can offset risks of forced displacement and there are schemes for instance in the Pacific in the Pacific to facilitate seasonal migration as a way of trying to allow people ways to sustain their livelihoods and offset risks of future forced displacement but uh but I think that the debate about migration and climate change particularly when it becomes very fixated on numbers and you know apocalyptic apocalyptic projections of mass displacement tends to then feed into this discussion of polycrisis and migration as part of a series of intersecting and potentially highly destabilizing crises because if large scale migration did occur on anything like the scale is projected it would be deeply disrupted and would be a security threat uh, but but measures to deter and uh, to, or to deter and prevent migration may actually feed in precisely or may actually exacerbate the risks and facilitating migration or mobility may be ways to offset some of those risks so to conclude what I, what I would argue is that crisis has become normalized as a mode of migration governance in Europe uh, I'd argue also in North America in other regions of the world I think that, that there are different kind of constellations of debate but the but Europe is obviously a particularly significant region because of its uh the wealth and the kind of power that it projects through the European Union to neighboring states and regions I think what we can see also is that political actors and an intellectual agenda supports a normalization of crisis and migration's place within it this can be because of you know opponents of migration but also be, can be a consequence of actors who want to draw attention to the importance of issues perhaps around climate and and protection of refugees in the face of climate change but I think it can contribute to also to a normalization of crisis uh, and this can then actively contribute to some of the risks against which uh, people are ostensibly claiming to warn so of course our, the risks of course are real and serious uh, and so many of the categories of polycrisis are, of course, real and serious and imminent threats, which uh, require significant sustained action, bringing together national governments, regional authorities and international organisations. But I think that migration should be extracted from this thinking or at least thought about differently. So I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in following up those are uh, my contacts. Thank you.